Hi, I'm Gina McGowan from Sydney, Australia, and I'm reading chapter 11 of Jane of Lantern Hill by L.A. Montgomery. Jane was to go to the island with Mr. and Mrs. Stanley, who were going down to visit a married daughter. Somehow, Jane lived through the last days. She was determined she would not make any fuss because that would be hard on Mother. There were no more goodnight confidences and caressings. No more little tender loving words spoken at special moments. But Jane somehow knew the two reasons for this. Mother could not bear it for one thing, and for another, Grandmother was resolved not to permit it. But on Jane's last night at 60 Gay, Mother did slip in when Grandmother was occupied by callers below. Mother! Mother! Darling, be brave. After all, it is only three months and the island is a lovely spot. You may, if I'd known, once I... Oh, it doesn't matter now. Nothing matters. Darling, there's one thing I must ask you to promise. You are never to mention me to your father. I won't, choked Jane. It was an easy promise. She couldn't imagine herself talking to him about mother. He will like you better if, if he thinks you don't love me too much, whispered mother. Down went her white lids over her blue eyes, but Jane had seen the look. She felt as if her heart were bursting. The sky at sunrise was blood red, but it soon darkened into sullen grey. At noon, a drizzle set in. I think the weather is sorry at you going away, said Jodie. Oh, Jane, I'll miss you so, and I don't know if I'll be here when you come back. Miss West says she's going to put me into an orphanage, and I don't want to be put in an orphanage, Jane. Here's the pretty shell Miss Ames brought me from the West Indies for me. It's the only pretty thing I have. I want you to have it because if I go to the orphanage, I suppose they'll take it away from me. The train left for Montreal at 11 that night and Frank took Jane and her mother to the station. She had kissed Grandmother and Aunt Gertrude goodbye dutifully. If you meet your Aunt Irene Fraser down on the island, remember me to her, said Grandmother. There was an odd little tone of exultation in her voice. Jane felt that Grandmother had got the better of Aunt Irene in some way, at some time, and wanted it rubbed in. It was as if she had said, she will remember me. And who was Aunt Irene? Sixty Gay seemed to scowl at her as they drove away. She had never liked it, and it had never liked her, but she felt drearily as if some gate of life was shut behind her when the door closed. She and Mother did not talk as they drove along over the elfish underground city that comes into view under the black street on a rainy night. She was determined she would not cry, and she did not. Her eyes were wide with dismay, but her voice was cool and quiet as she said goodbye. The last Robin Stewart saw of her was a gallant, indomitable little figure waving to her as Mrs Stanley herded her into the door of the Pullman. They reached Montreal in the morning and left at noon on the Maritime Express. The time was to come when the very name of Maritime Express was to thrill Jane with ecstasy, but now it meant exile. It rained all day. Mrs Stanley pointed out the mountains, but Jane was not having any mountains just then. Mrs Stanley thought her very stiff and unresponsive and eventually left her alone, for which Jane would have thanked God, fasting if she had ever heard of the phrase. Mountains! When every turn of the wheels was carrying her further away from Mother. <coughs> the next day they went down through New Brunswick, lying in the grey light of a cheerless ah. rain. It was raining when they got to Sackville and transferred to the little branch line that went, ran down to Cape Tormentine. We take the car ferry there across to the island, Mrs Stanley explained. Mrs Stanley had given up trying to talk to her. She thought Jane quite the dumbest child she had ever encountered. She had not the slightest inkling that Jane's silence was her only bulwark against wild, rebellious tears, and Jane would not cry. It was not actually raining when they reached the Cape. As they went on board the car ferry, the sun was hanging, a flat red ball in a rift of clouds to the west. But it soon darkened down again. There was a grey choppy strait under a grey sky with dirty ranks of clouds around the edges. By the time they got on the train again, it was pouring harder than ever. Jane had been seasick on the way across and was now terribly tired. So this was Prince Edward Island. This rain-drenched land where the trees cringed before the wind and the heavy clouds seemed almost to touch the fields. Jane had no eyes for blossoming orchard or green meadow or soft-bosomed hills with scarfs of dark spruce across their shoulders. They would be in Charlottetown in a couple of hours, so Mrs Stanley said, and her father was to meet her there. Her father, who didn't love her, as Mother said, and who lived in a hovel, as Grandmother said. She knew nothing else about him. She wished she knew something, anything. What did he look like? Would he have pouchy eyes like Uncle David? 
a thin, sewed up mouth like Uncle William? Would he wink at the end of every sentence like old Mr. Doran when he came to call on grandmother? She was a thousand miles away from mother and felt as if it were a million. Terrible waves of loneliness went over her. The train was pulling into the station. Here we are, Victoria, said Mrs. Stanley in a tone of relief.